Good evening, everybody. I'm going to go ahead and get started. I've got a, uh, a ton of material, so I'm going to get rolling for us. My, uh, my favorite TV show of all time is a show called Supernatural. And I am well aware that probably most people in here have no idea what that is, which is totally fine. But that show ran from 2005 all the way to just last year at the end of 2020. So it ran for 15 years. It is one of the longest running TV shows in history, 327 episodes, and I like to say I have seen every one of them. So it is a very culty type TV show. And when you're into something like that, especially when it started in the dark ages, you know, like pre-streaming in 2005, uh, when something started that long ago, your friends would ask you about it and you would say, hey, I, I, you ought to check it out. But the problem is, is you couldn't just go to Netflix and stream it. You had to have the DVDs, they had to catch reruns, and they would go, I want to go watch that. When does it come on? And I would go, well, you, you can't go watch it. And they would go, why not? And I'd go, because if you start in the middle of the series, what you're going to do is you're going to completely misunderstand everything. You're not going to know the story of what happened to these guys' mother when, you know, they were little kids. You're not going to know about the brother's relationship. You're not going to know about the car. You're not going to know about how to kill all these monsters and demons in the show. Like, you've got to start at the beginning. And when I was putting together this lesson, that's actually kind of how I felt. Because at first, I was like, I'm just going to give you like 10 tips of how do you talk to your kids. And the more that I, I thought about it, and the more I realized, no, we need to really talk about pornography itself. And that's not an easy topic. But the reality is, I think pornography is one of the most destructive forces to our young people's hearts and minds. It seems like, though, very few people want to talk about it. I don't know why that is. I've got a lot of ideas and theories. I think part of it is we are scared. I think part of it's we're ill-equipped. Maybe we're just embarrassed. I will tell you that I think some people don't think it's that big of a deal. Uh, I'm going to tell you that it is. Uh, but there are a lot of reasons that people don't want to talk about it. But my question to you is this. Where would you rather discussions about pornography and sexual issues come from? Would you rather us talk about it here in the church, or would you rather allow the world to dominate that discussion? Because I'll tell you something, if we don't talk about it, the world will. They will talk to our kids about this topic, and they have no problems doing so. So here's what I want to do. I'm going to make a few points first before we get into how you talk to your kids, and I think these are extremely important. And the first one is, I think you need to recognize that pornography is a major problem. Like I said, there are some people who don't think it's that big of a deal, but I want to tell you that the sexual exposure that our kids face in this world today is really unparalleled in the history of mankind. Between TV, internet, magazines, billboards, movies, social media, we live in a sex-crazed, sex-saturated society. We absolutely do. I don't know if you know Dan Chambers from Concord Road, but Dan Chambers has said multiple times that he believes that sexual freedom is the God that we bow down to and worship in this society today. And I think he's right. The difference between just 20 years ago and today is pretty hard to comprehend. Today, 75% of primetime TV shows have sexual content that would not even have been allowed on television. There are 2.5 billion, with a B, porn emails sent out every single day. And peer pressure for our youth to know about sex and to be sexually active is through the roof, and they are faced with sexual decisions before they even understand what sex is and what the consequences of that might be. And we have become desensitized to it. I am convinced of that. Let me give you just a few statistics of how prevalent this is in our society. There are almost 18,000 new adult movies created every single year. That's about 50 a day. Porn sites receive more regular traffic than Netflix, Amazon, and Twitter combined each and every month. 35% of all internet downloads are porn related. In 2016, 4,599,000,000 hours were spent on just one the world's largest porn site. 11 porn sites are among the world's top 300 most popular internet sites. And the most popular site is at number 18 and outranks the likes of eBay and Netflix. 
Pornography is estimated to be a 12 to 13 billion dollar industry in the U.S. To put that as perspective, that is slightly more than the NFL when it was at its peak. If we were to go global, it's a 97 billion dollar industry. How big is that? Well, combine the NFL, Major League Baseball, the National Hockey League, and the NBA, and all of them combined to be worth about 31 billion. So that means the porn industry is three times more valuable than America's four major sports leagues combined. That's about $30 a person annually, which is more money than is spent on gambling. It's larger than all of Hollywood's domestic box office receipts, and it is larger than all the revenue generated by rock and country music combined. At $97 billion, porn is only slightly behind Microsoft, and that is it. Those stats are unbelievable. I mean, they really are. I don't know if they are, they are shocking to you. They should be. But let's get back down to reality. How often do people actually view porn? Well, the reality is they do it a lot. The Barna organization, which many of you might be familiar with, did a study recently on people who seek out pornography. And the reason that they did the study on seeking out is a lot of people do stumble upon it by accident, okay? especially young people. But they wanted to do a study on how many people intentionally seek it out and how many hours they were spending. And here's what they found. Of all people 13 years and older, 51% of people intentionally seek out porn once a month. 33% of all people 13 or older look at porn at least once a week. And as many as 12% of all people 13 and older Look at porn intentionally every single day. When you trim it down to the age groups of 13 to 24, 64% say they seek it out at least once a week. And you want to know what's amazing about that? This isn't even the most concerning part. The most concerning part is this. Young people see it as a pretty flippant thing. There is a large gap between those who are 25 and older and what they think of pornography versus those that are under 25. Over half of all adults, 25 or older, 54%, if we're going to be exact, say that they believe viewing pornography is a moral issue and that is morally wrong. But if you get down to the 13 to 24 demographic, only 32% believe it is morally wrong. So between 13 and 24, that means 68% of people do not see anything at all wrong with viewing porn. As a matter of fact, would you like to know what they view as immoral? Things like wanting something that belongs to someone else, which I find quite ironic today, using too much water or electricity, overeating, so they think fat people are more immoral than viewing pornography. And I'm serious about that, I'm not joking. Uh, thinking negatively about someone with a different point of view than you, not recycling. Those things are all more immoral according to 13 to 24 year olds than pornography. So when you combine that attitude with what we have going on in our society, we have a very serious problem. Because what we have is we've taken a sin that can damage hearts and damage minds, that can damage a relationship with God, that can damage marriages, and we have convinced ourselves, especially those that are younger, that it just isn't a big deal. And you might ask yourself, well, why would there be such a big age gap? Why would those 25 and older see it as a much more immoral thing than those who are 24 and younger? Well, I think the answer is pretty simple. It's accessibility. Accessibility has made it not a big deal. You see, the younger you are, the more desensitized you have become to it because nudity, sex, and porn are everywhere. I mean, one of the largest movements in our society right now is all about your sexual preference. So we have taken this, and there was a time, if you were a little bit older, that you remember when access to those things wasn't prevalent. It wasn't easily accessible. It wasn't easy to be gotten. And I think that's the second point I want to make here, is accessibility is different now than when you were a child. The rise of pornography addiction in the entire Western society is based upon this principle. It is easy to get, and it can be done totally anonymously. 
In years past, getting pornography was much more difficult, and there was a really important element involved, and that's the element of shame. Pornography could only be bought in an adult bookstore. It could only be bought in shops that would carry the magazines and the DVDs, and it was necessary for an individual to go through several steps to be able to access it. You at least had to have a friend, a buddy, somebody that could get it for you, but then you have other ways like this. You had to get into your car. You had to drive to a store. You actually had to shop for a DVD or a magazine or a VHS, and you had to pay for it at a cash register. There were people that would know what you were doing. Even if you got it from a friend, they knew what you were doing. There was no such thing as being anonymous. It wasn't possible. But that's completely changed. You can now access it on your laptop, on an iPhone, or any device whatsoever that has any internet access. You can find it for free online. It won't cost you a dime. And someone could be sitting in the back of a church classroom or a pew viewing pornography, and you wouldn't know it. And you know what? Somebody says, well, that's crazy. It's not. I have actually literally had a youth minister come to me to ask me what to do because he had a kid viewing porn on the back row at a youth event. So that's the kind of thing that we are now dealing with because it can be viewed in a way that is completely anonymous. And this newfound element is really important because it takes away guilt and it gives the feeling there are no consequences unless you get caught. And I'm here to tell you that the consequences are very real, whether we want to admit it or not. There are some very real-world consequences. And I want to throw a few at you, and these are not exaggerations. They are real things that we need to be aware of. Number one, pornography harms our children. You know, it's been estimated that one in three girls and one in seven boys will be molested before they are the age of 18. And the relationship between hardcore pornography usage and that abuse is pretty compelling. 77% of those who molest boys and 87% of those who molest girls will freely admit that they use hardcore pornography on a regular basis. That's the ones that will admit it, by the way. Okay. Number two, we know that pornography degrades women. And this is something that is really, really important. Women are seen as animals, as playthings, as sex objects, as merchandise, and this creates all kinds of problems in marriages. Trust me, it's true because I see it on a regular basis. Counseling a couple right now where this is a major, major issue in their marriage because what it does is it sets up an inappropriate view of what God intended for the relationship between a man and woman to be, and it can create some very unrealistic expectations. Among those who have admitted to having extramarital affairs, over, they are over 300% more likely to be using porn than those who have not had an affair. Also, those who watched porn while they were married were twice as likely to be divorced as those who didn't, and women who watched porn during marriage were three times as likely to be divorced than those who didn't. People who view porn are simply less happy in their marriages, and all studies will show that. This one is amazing to me. A study of 14 to 19-year-old girls found that those who viewed pornography were actually at a significantly greater likelihood of being victims of sexual harassment and sexual assault. I find that amazing because what it appears to say is just simply by doing that, they're willing to put themselves in situations that are more dangerous just simply by looking at it because they have become desensitized to the dangers that somebody else might actually catch. Another one is we know that pornography desensitizes us to deviant behaviors all the way around. You know, what was once shocking or revolting now becomes ordinary, becomes acceptable, it becomes commonplace. And those who view on a regular basis start to become completely desensitized to all types of deviant behaviors, not just sexual behaviors. What is really important about that, listen to this study by, that was done. Cass Sustine of Duke, said that some sexual violence against women, quote, would not have occurred if it wasn't for the massive circulation of pornography. 
He did a large study on this, and here's what they found. That the liberalization of pornography laws in the U.S., Britain, Australia, and Scandinavian countries has been accompanied by a rise in reported rapes. And in countries where pornography laws have not been liberalized, there has been a less steep rise in those rapes. And in countries where restrictions have been adopted, guess what? It's decreased. Pretty fascinating. Long story short, it seems to be that people will do whatever it is to get what they want if they are addicted to this behavior. And that brings up another really interesting point, that it is as addictive as any drug. There are a lot of people who want to tell you that it's not. And although the field of research on it is pretty young, there's one thing that is certain. It is very much addictive. Some experts will tell you that it is more difficult to kick pornography addiction than it is to kick a crack cocaine or heroin addiction. And the reason is really simple. You're dealing with your brain. And what's fascinating is a drug addict has to actually have their drug to get their high, but a pornography addict does not have to do that. They can recall porn images in their mind and masturbate to those, and they get the same high. And it is important to note that what happens is the body is releasing chemicals into the brain and into the nervous system. And what is so powerful about that is this. If you are addicted to those chemicals and doing whatever is necessary to get your high, that is the same thing as being a drug addict. That is exactly the same thing. And the difference is now the drug is in your body and you produce it naturally and you can have access to it anytime you want it. And what's really fascinating is some research is now suggesting that what actually happens during the, in the brain during healthy sexual activity, which as Christians we would say that would be with our spouse, but what is happening in the brain in healthy sexual activity and between those who are uh, masturbating to pornography is actually two different things. That the brain actually knows the difference and the chemical release in the brain is a different thing, which is just fascinating. And finally, we'll kind of wrap this section up with this. Pornography is completely devoid of real intimacy and causes objectification. This is a real problem among young people, okay? Pornography is a disembodied visual experience without the attachment or intimacy of sex. Basically what it is is a short circuit of the process. You get the, medical, med the mental and partial physical payoff, but you don't actually have to have a real relationship because the relationship is a fantasy in your head. What is dangerous about that is this. If you add in that one third of teens think pornography, don't think pornography is immoral, and you couple that with our technology that we have today, what do you think that creates? Things like sexting. Things where teens will send images to one another. And if you don't think that's a real thing, studies show that 62% of teens have received a nude image from somebody that they know, 62%. 40% of teens say they have sent a nude image to someone that they know. Now, I don't know about you, but that's terrifying. Absolutely terrifying. And what's really important about that is that's the next step in pornography because now it becomes personal. It invites us to sexualize relationships before we are ready to, but it also invites us to disembody and therefore detach from our relationships. In essence, what that means is it causes us to objectify the person. You have a crush on a girl, a little persuasion, you might convince her to send you a topless photo. You get to experience her and probably personal pleasure without any intimacy, without physical proximity, without any of the risks of physical sex. And here's the other crazy part about that. Typically what happens is when this photo is sent, there is validation and self-worth that comes back. Boy, how attractive you are and telling the girl how wonderful she is. And by objectifying her, what does that do? Fills her, val validates her, gives her self-worth, and encourages her basically to do it again because she feels good about herself. We haven't even gotten to things that I can't address tonight because we don't have time. How you, that can be used to blackmail people how it can be used to embarrass people and ruin people's lives, how it can be shared with other people. We could go on and on. We could talk about that for two or three hours. But here's my question. In just those few minutes there, have I convinced you we've got a problem? So what do we do about it? Unfortunately, it's not going away. So how do we talk to our children? 
Well, I believe there are some simple things that we can do. And that begins by doing things like we're doing tonight. Being willing to openly talk about this. You know, when I get asked to do a topic like this, where I'm asked to give tips on how to talk about something or how to address an issue, I actually think we approach it really wrong. We approach it as I've got to set everything up appropriately to address this topic with my child. But here's the problem with that approach. You are setting up every single day as a parent how easy it is for you to talk about your child about this topic or any difficult topic with just how you handle them on a daily basis. Let me give you an example of what, I've, what I'm talking about. I've seen parents say, you know, my child can come to me and they can talk to me about anything. And then the kid comes to the parent to talk to them about anything. And what does the parent do? Loses their mind. And I can guarantee you that if you do that in your home, having a discussion about a topic like this is not going to work because your kid is just going to turn you off. So my number one tip from talking to your child about pornography in your house is this, emotional safety. Your house has to be an emotionally safe place. Now let me say something, because I want everybody to hear this. I understand how that concept sounds. That sounds like a pansy, wimpy thing to say. I know that. But here's the thing. We only share difficult things with people who are safe. You and I both know that. We only share difficult things with people who are safe. As a counselor, it is my job to sit in a room with people and it does not matter how crazy or difficult or shocking the thing is that they tell me, I have to make them comfortable in telling me. Because if I don't, guess what happens? They will not talk to me. That's the whole point, right? If they aren't comfortable, they won't talk. And as parents, part of our job is making our home an emotionally safe place for our children. That means that if they are brave enough to come and tell us about something they are struggling with, we have to have enough self-control not to fly off the handle. And that does not mean that we may not have to punish them. I'm not saying that at all, so don't read that into what I'm saying. That does not mean that there may not have to be some major changes that have to happen for them in their life. But what it does mean is they feel comfortable coming to talk to us. And we set that up long before it is time to have a difficult talk like this. So number one, your house has to be an emotionally safe place. Number two, you have to teach them guilt and not shame. And that may, again, it's kind of like the first one. I know how that sounds. It may sound like semantics and it may sound like kind of a wimpy thing. But I'm telling you there is a large difference. I teach this all the time in counseling. When we are talking about the concept of guilt, I believe that is absolutely biblical. The idea of guilt is we mess up and we make a mistake and there is hope for redemption from that mistake. That is a biblical concept. But what happens if you make a mistake and you feel as if there is no opportunity for redemption? That you feel like now you are the mistake and there is no attempt to recover from something terrible that happens to you. I'll give you a great example of this. A few years ago, I counseled a guy who had an affair, and he came to me, and I asked him a very simple question. I said, do you want to fix your marriage or not? I said, I don't, don't tell me what I want to hear, because I know, because we were both members of the church. I said, don't tell me what I want to hear. I want you to tell me the truth. He spent an hour telling me how much he loved his wife and kids, how much he wanted to fix everything, and I thought, man, we're golden. I can help him and his wife work through this scenario. And right before he left, you know what he told me? He said, I'm going to go ahead and leave my wife and kids. And I thought I was going to have to pick my job off the floor. And he said, I said, why? I'm not letting you leave till you tell me why you would make such a horribly poor decision. He said, Ryan, I have messed up so bad that no one will ever forgive me. There's your difference between guilt and shame. If someone feels there is no hope, there is no chance for redemption, they will continue to spiral. And your children are exactly the same. If they feel like they are flawed and that there's no hope for them to recover from a mistake they have made, you are teaching them that they are the mistake, not that they've made a mistake. And there's an enormous difference. And here's something that I think is important for us to know 
And I, since I don't know, really know hardly anyone here, I'm not pointing at anybody specifically, okay? But a majority of porn addicts are found in homes where parents are very strict, very rigid, and very controlling. Or they are found in homes in which parents are disinterested and disengaged in their children's lives. There is a high correlation between addiction, just addiction in general, and parents who shame children. Children who are shamed often turn to behaviors that are comforting to soothe emotional rejection. And you know what? If you grow up in a controlling and manipulative home, you end up, usually end up having horrible coping mechanisms. So it is an unfortunate thing, but it is a true thing that shaming exists in many Christian homes. Just being real with you. When our children don't live up to expectations, and you know what? Oftentimes that can lead to a cycle that creates horrible addiction problems later in life. There are some studies that show that pornography is more of a problem among Christian teens than it is among the general population. And I'm going to tell you why I think that is. Because you see, a Christian teen probably knows I can't go drink if mom and dad find that out. I probably can't be doing drugs. But you know what? I have my phone. And they can very quickly get involved in an addiction that is just as bad, if not worse. So that's important. Very, very important. Number three, the discussion needs to happen at a very young age. Research shows that if you haven't talked to your children about sex by the age of 10, you will not be the person that introduces them to sex. And I think that's really important. Between their peers, between school, between TV, internet, between accidentally opening up a porn email or stumbling across something, this discussion needs to be had earlier, not later. Now let's be really clear, if you're approaching a 10 year old, you don't have to get into all the details. Okay, that's not what I'm meaning. But you can talk about it in a general sense and look for teachable moments. Look for moments where it's natural. I told my son I was going to say this. I know it's going to probably embarrass him, but when my 13-year-old, when he was about eight, he asked us about mating and about animals. That is a perfect opportunity to talk about that with your child. And a lot of people think that's crazy, but you don't have to go into detail because he had a question and he wanted a question answered. And part of the reason for having that talk is you can warn them about things. Another thing to understand, and I know this makes weird some people out, but listen to me. Children understand the idea of being close. Most kids love hugs. They love to snuggle with their mother. They love to hold hands, to put their arms around someone. You can tell them that mom and dads have a special way to be close. And that's not weird or gross. It's not taboo. You can have that conversation. You can be real with your children. And that is very important. And the more casual it is, the better. You know, the first time we talked to him about that, we were on a drive home from Disney World. And we were answering a question, right? It was casual. And being in the car was great because we didn't have to look at him and he didn't have to look at us. It was fantastic. <laughs> but what that does is it takes the pressure off of both parties, right? If you say, hey, it's time for us to have the sex talk. Or, hey, we need to talk about pornography. How do you think that's going to go? But what's crazy is that's how most people do it. And so the important part about that is don't plan it out. Everybody's going to be on edge. Everybody's not going to want to talk about it. Look for those natural moments. It just feels different. And the more casual it is and the more laid back it is, usually the better the conversation will go. Set up a judgment-free zone. Your child needs to know that there is no judgment when you are having conversations like this. You are not accusing them of anything. You are not warning them of future punishment. If you set it up as a punitive, judgmental thing, you are very unlikely to be able to engage your child at all about these topics. I cannot stress enough the importance of being an emotionally safe person for your children to approach. They will not only help you with this topic, it will help you with any topic you have to discuss with them. Now, this kind of, I know, kind of sort of overlaps some of the other things, but it's sort of important to me. Talk about it in a real, honest, and direct way. And here's what I mean about this. Don't be afraid to let them ask questions. 
Don't be afraid of that. I hear this all the time, and it happens every time I give this talk. Somebody comes up to me and asks me. So I'm telling you now so you don't have to come ask me, okay? And that is, they will say, well, can our, can our kids handle it? Can they take it? Will they be overwhelmed? No, they're not going to be overwhelmed. Yes, they can take it. Sure, they may not fully understand everything, but sometimes we treat our kids like they're breakable. It's okay to have these talks, and their little minds can understand it if you do a good job in describing things to them. Kids can take it, and if you let them ask questions and deal with the topic head on, the crazy part about it is it usually becomes a non-issue in the long run. That is so, so important to make sure you handle it that way. Their curiosities are dealt with, and instead of potentially exploring it on their own, which you do not want to have happen in 2021, um, you are able to come to some sort of understanding with them. You set the tone with your children, and they can handle it if you have the conversation. You can tell them they might see something. I think this is really important. Just to let your kids know, hey, you may run across something by accident, and if you do, you're not in trouble. Come tell me. Come tell me that you ran across something. And again, how you respond to that is hugely important. Let them know they may see someone without their clothes on. That can happen very quickly and very easily. They may see someone doing something they don't understand, but leave the door open for them to feel as if they can come to you about that. Set the stage that you are a safe place for them to land if something is really bothering them. And finally, it's this one. I don't know how we're doing on time. I'm trying to rush and make sure we get it all in. Parents need to monitor their kids' devices. I am floored, absolutely floored, how many parents don't monitor their kids' devices. Blows my mind. And the excuse that they always make is they want their kids to have privacy. Well, forget that. Look, I get it. A lot of parents feel like their child deserves privacy and respect, and guess what? I believe that too. Kids do need some privacy. They do need some respect, but here's the thing. That does not mean that you don't have the right and that you shouldn't check their devices, because you absolutely should. And I believe it's all in how you set it up. You know, if you set it up with the idea that your child having a device is a privilege and that you are going to pay for it for them, that's a privilege, and they need to learn that for a whole other reason. But those things, if you set it up in that way, you can let them to know, look, if you're going to have this device, I have access to everything on it, including all of your social media accounts, and I will look at it on occasion. I will. And that does not mean I'm trying to get you into trouble. It does not mean that I don't trust you, even though don't trust them at all. Um, what it means is that you are doing your job as a parent and that you love them, that you are trying to protect them, that you have their best interest in mind. And you know what? You don't have to make a scene out of it. My son doesn't know it, but he's going to find out right now. I've checked his devices before when he didn't know it, right? It happens. And the reason that I think that is so important is it doesn't have to be a big deal, but I know if history is deleted or if I know if I see something that shouldn't be there, we've got a problem, right? So make those things open up for your children and make sure that you monitor everything that they do. Why is this so important? Well, it sets up the idea of you helping them avoid stumbling into something. And it is easier to stop a problem before it starts than trying to fix a major problem later down the road. That is so important. So just a couple of quick things and then I'll wrap it up. Think about Job 31.1. I made a covenant with my eyes not to look with lust upon a young woman. 2 Timothy 2.22 says, Flee also youthful lust, but pursue righteousness, faith, love, peace with those who call on the Lord out of a pure heart. One of my absolute favorites is Martin Luther once said, You can't keep a bird from flying over your head, but you can keep him from building a nest in your hair. Love that. And Mark Twain said there are several good protections against temptation, but the surest of them is cowardice. You know, on the TV show Hee Haw, I don't know if anybody remembers that show. I'm probably almost too young to remember it, but my grandparents used to watch it all the time, and I loved it, still love it. And uh, on that show, Doc Campbell is confronted by a patient 
A patient comes in, he says he broke his arm in two places, and Doc replies, well, then you might want to stay out of them two places. I think he's on to something because we cannot regularly put ourselves in the face of temptation and expect not to be affected by it. When faced with a problem of temptation, we need to take Doc's advice and we need to stay out of them places. And as a part of avoidance, I want to ask you this question. And this is for you and for your children in a topic like this. Are you helping your child be intentional about being holy? In my line of work, if I've heard it once, I've heard it a thousand times. I never meant for this to happen. I never meant for this to happen. And I don't mean for this to sound rude or bad or smart aleck or any of those things, but I always think to myself, but you were not intentional about keeping it from happening. This is a situation where you have to be intentional about keeping it from happening. You know, you don't just miraculously get pregnant. You don't accidentally get your master's degree. You don't accidentally get in your car every day and drive to work. There may be one that you feel like that, but that's not how it happens, right? I would say you don't accidentally view pornography either. I understand that there are addictive elements, but the reality is people who stumble into this aren't intentional about avoiding it. You have to be on guard at all times, and Satan is always going to try to deceive our children. Never forget we're sexual beings created by God with sexual desires. And I heard a preacher say this one time, Satan does everything he possibly can to get us to be sexually active before marriage and everything he can to keep us from being sexually active after we are married. And I believe that to be true. But here's the thing. We want to make sure we see sin for what it intentionally is and avoid it. And the last thing, and I'll make this really quick, we got to realize sex is not the enemy. You know, I grew up, and, and I don't mean this in a bad way, I don't remember hardly ever talking about it at church. Almost never. But sex is not bad. It was created by God for us to enjoy in its proper context. And the problem that we have in this world with all of these issues is because we have perverted a wonderful thing that God made for us. We need to address this openly. We need to address this honestly and appropriately and stop being afraid of this topic because if we don't teach this topic, the world will teach it to our children. And it needs to come from places like this and not places like out there, okay? So thank you for being here. I know I crammed a lot in there. I tried to be really fast to get it all in. But if you have any questions, I'm happy to try to answer those for you.